Hi, welcome to the second in a series of webinars for reducing toxics in childcare. Today we'll be talking about healthy cleaning, ways to clean and uh, sanitize and disinfect your uh, childcare setting without using harmful chemicals. So today we will be learning about uh, why children are more vulnerable to chemicals of concern in their environment and also why you should be concerned for yourself and other employees uh, in terms of the chemicals used in cleaning products. We'll also learn about the chemicals of concern that are found uh, in cleaning products in the early childhood setting and what kind of health impacts they may have. And then we'll really dig into briefly the practical and low-cost solutions for green cleaning and healthy cleaning in your facility. So let's get started. First, let me tell you a little bit about Clean and Healthy New York. So I'm Bobby Wilding. I'm deputy director and co-founder. We established Clean and Healthy New York in 2006. And our, our tagline is promoting safer chemicals, a sustainable economy, and a healthier world. So we really accomplished that by and, and are focused on protecting health by getting toxic chemicals out of everyday things. And we do that in three primary ways. We advocate for policy changes, uh, whether they're in regulation or law at the local, state, and federal level. Uh, so we've been successful in uh, establishing restrictions on bisphenol A, BPA, certain flame retardant chemicals, and heavy metals in certain children's products. Um, and we advocate for a broader set of uh, changes to make sure that we all have access to um, safer, health or healthier products. We also seek that by working to change the marketplace. So we want manufacturers and retailers to do their part and voluntarily establish restrictions on chemicals of concern and know and understand what's in the products that they're making and selling. And uh, in the uh, sector related to childcare, we have a Getting Ready for Baby national campaign, which we would encourage you to consider joining. Talk a little bit about that at the very end. Uh, we also train people uh, on how to avoid chemicals, and, and we've actually trained over 700 childcare providers now. This slide's a little bit out of date, but we also work with nurses, businesses, and others um, to understand how, wh what the risks are and, and how folks can be engaged. And finally, really, we win by collaborating with others. We partner with groups across New York State and around the country and really around the world to make change so that everyone has access to safer, healthier uh, daily environments. So that's about Clean and Healthy New York. So let's just talk a little bit about how chemicals such as the things used to make cleaning products get into our bodies. First of all, we can ingest them and swallow them. Um, you can see a, here's a baby chewing on a rubber ducky. It's not just about the food we eat, although that is definitely a way that we can be uh, coming into contact or taking those chemicals into our bodies. But also if there are chemicals in products that we're putting into our mouths or have settled onto products um, or our residues, all of those can be ingested. We can inhale them. So if you're using a cleaning product and you're spraying something, uh, you'll actually be inhaling some of those droplets um, and breathing them in. And if you're uh, using a cleaning product, if you're spraying it, it could settle on your skin and you could uh, absorb it. Um, you can also uh, absorb it if you're dipping your hand into a cleaning solution or if once you spray, some of the cleaning solution gets onto, uh, onto your body. So those are ways that chemicals get in during use of products. But also, prenatal exposures are really important. Um, we can be exposed to chemicals while we're, our bodies are still developing. And if we're pregnant, the, our, our um, developing fetuses can uh, be exposed to the chemicals that we're exposed to and that we take into our bodies. So it's important to think about that as we are thinking about the um, materials and products that we use every day. But there's a unique vulnerability that children have. They're more susceptible to uh, the chemicals they're exposed to than we might be as adults um, for a variety of reasons. One is their behavior. We all know that babies and toddlers, they're crawling around and they put everything in their mouths. So they crawl on the floor, then they put their hands in their mouths. They will chew on anything they can get their mouths on, furniture, uh, bottles, keys, you name it, right? Um, they also, because they're developing 
they need more inputs than we do. So for pound for pound, for every pound of, of baby versus every pound of an adult, babies and toddlers are breathing more air, they're drinking more water, and they're consuming more food. So their uh, actual, if, you know, if we're in the same airspace, um, they're actually more exposed to whatever's still in the air than we would be. If we're thinking about water, um, in term, they're more likely to be, they're going to be ingesting a greater quantity for their body size than we are. So their exposure is going to be higher. And finally, babies' bodies and toddlers' bodies are still developing. That first thousand days that people talk about for um, appropriate curriculum development uh, is also really critical for just all biological development. Organs are still developing. The brain is still coming into focus. Um, and so uh, when chemicals can disrupt uh, development, and there's critical windows during which uh, our bodies are trying frantically to send those signals back and forth to make sure that everything goes right. It's a lot easier to create a problem at that point. And so um, those critical windows of development, including the first thousand days, um, are times when chemical exposures can actually have a more profound impact than later or at other times. And finally, children are actually in a different environment, even if they're literally in the same room. We sit in spaces that are, you know, three feet off the ground or four feet off the ground, and we stand in spaces that are five or six feet off the ground, right? Babies and toddlers are much closer to the floor. So everything that settles to the floor gets kicked up as people walk, particularly on carpets. And so the air that they're breathing is actually different air. Um, and it really does make a difference in terms of what they're um, being exposed to uh, in the same space that we're in. So it, it makes a difference. So we see evidence that uh, the chemicals that are being used in our daily environments are having an impact on health problems that are increasing. So we see a, we've seen a rapid rise in developmental disabilities that now affect nearly 7% of all kids ages 3 to 17. We've seen ongoing increases in the diagnosis rate for childhood cancer. Thankfully, uh, medical science has really helped us reduce the mortality rate, so fewer children are dying. But more families, more children are going through the trauma, both to their emotions, but also to their body from the, those treatments. Um, and there are a whole lot of impacts that come from that, of course. So leukemia has increased by 35% since 1975, um, and that is one of the um, most common forms of childhood cancer. Childhood diabetes is also on the rise, both type 1 and type 2. And it's increasing in type 2 diabetes, it's increasing almost 5% every year, year over year over year. Um, that's alarming. And uh, we have found that there, you know, scientific research has found that certain chemicals disrupt our bodies in ways that actually change how fat accumulates in our bodies, which can contribute to a whole host of other problems, um, and diabetes is part of that mix. So let's talk a little bit about cleaning. Why do we clean? You know, we clean to uh, remove, you know, organic material, dirt, debris, you know, dog hair, uh, you know, dust. Um, we clean to remove bacteria, right? That's what we do with sanitizing and disinfecting. But really, ultimately, the reason that we want clean spaces is to protect our health. Um, we really want a healthy space to live in, and that's why it's so important to maintain a clean environment in a childcare setting, right? You're wanting to make sure that diseases don't get transferred. Um, you also want to make sure that you're not using materials that could be um, harming children's health in other ways. So there are three components to cleaning um, that you have heard about, I'm sure. And the first is just cleaning, which is that physical removal of, divert, of dirt and organic contamination, bugs, sand, you know, uh, all of those things. And um, they can be removed using soap and water um, or uh, using microfiber cloths in the case of dusting. Um, to just physically remove the material, right? Um, then there's sanitizing, which is using a, um, a method, whether it's chemical or physical, to remove and 
uh, reduce the number of germs on surfaces like food contact surfaces and pacifiers. Um, that's sanitizing. And disinfecting is actually seeking to destroy most of the germs on hard surfaces. So there are different strategies that we can use for all of them. And it's really worth noting that sanitizing and disinfecting only work if the cleaning has happened first. So if you're using a product that says that it sanitizes or says that it cleans and sanitizes at the same time, you have to clean first. You have to remove all of those um, literally physical objects from the surface um, before uh, the sanitizing or disinfecting will actually be effective. So when we're thinking about cleaning products, you, know, you can see uh, some examples here, of, you know, Comet, which contains bleach, um, you know, Spick and Span, which is a, just a regular uh, floor cleaner, um, or pure ammonia. Cleaning products can contain a whole array of, of chemicals, and um, there's actually new uh, rules for companies to disclose what are in cleaning products that will be going into effect in the next couple of years coming out of California and New York State that are going to require companies to actually, for the first time, tell us what's in cleaning products completely. Um, and the chemicals of concern are pretty broad, and there are um, 34 to 36 uh, between California and New York um, specific chemicals of concern. Um, but for our purposes today, let's just talk about a few of the, the worst of the worst. Ammonia is um, a respiratory irritant and uh, can trigger respiratory problems, uh, breathing problems, and both the people who are doing the cleaning and people who are around products that have been cleaned, materials that have been cleaned, areas that have been cleaned by ammonia. Bleach is uh, chlorine-based, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Also can trigger asthma. Nonalphenol ethoxylates, NPEs, are hormone disruptors, so they can actually affect the way um, our body tries to communicate internally. Um, and phthalates. Phthalates are also hormone disruptors. They're most often used in um, fragrances in cleaning products, um, and the word fragrance is a cover for um, an unknown number of chemicals in a product. So uh, if you see the word fragrance on a product, um, it's very likely that phthalates are present. And it's a group of chemicals that uh, can uh, trigger asthma attacks. Uh, they've been shown to actually create at new asthma cases, and they are hormone disruptors and can have a wider range of other health impacts. So in the Caring for Our Children, Appendix J, the focus is on routine cleaning with uh, detergent and water to remove germs from surfaces. Um, but then for specific areas, you'll need to take the additional step after cleaning to sanitize or disinfect based on state uh, requirements. Okay, so uh, bleach. This is the uh, sanitizing and disinfecting active ingredient that used to be the only thing you could use. So for food surfaces and changing areas, it used to be that a bleach solution that needed to be mixed and labeled daily needed to be prepared for those different areas. And it had a drying time in order to be effective. Um, and it uh, has been classified as an asthma gen, which means that it creates asthma cases in people who did not have asthma before. Um, the good news is there are a whole host of new non-chlorine based solutions and one of the um, kinds that we're most um, excited about are the peroxide based solutions because when they do their job, the active ingredient just breaks down into water and oxygen. So there's no harmful byproduct left behind. There's no chlorine molecules left behind. There's It's just water and oxygen from the active ingredient. So, um, you can find non-toxic alternatives um, that are registered with the EPA as being effective for the purpose of killing bacteria and uh, to some extent viruses. And um, there's a lot of information in, in one of the resources I'll share with you in a minute that will help you um, identify the products that may work best for your facility. And I just wanna reiterate that you can clean using um, 
many sort of do-it-yourself kind of uh, solutions. You can clean to remove dirt and debris using a microfiber cloth and water with no additional chemicals. You can clean to remove uh, materials using just regular soap and water. You don't have to have a special high cost, uh, fancy cleaning product in order to clean effectively. Um, when it comes to some of the alternatives to bleach, they can sometimes be more expensive than, than bleach. But one of the ways that other providers have found to sort of keep their whole cleaning budget the same is to invest in some of those low cost DIY solutions for cleaning and to save their, the money in their budget for the sanitizing and disinfecting and making sure that you're only sanitizing and disinfecting in the parts of your facility that you need to. Okay, so how do you actually choose safer cleaning products? Um, there are a whole host of labels that can appear that would tell you maybe that it's green or healthier or non-toxic, um, but there's a way you can actually tell for sure. So first of all, when it comes to sanitizers, focus on only choosing EPA registered products for sanitizing and disinfecting, and then look for what are called third-party certifications. Um, third-party means that they're entirely independent of the company that's making the product. So a first-party certification would be the company tells you, we've done testing and it doesn't contain BPA. And so it would be they would certify that their own product meets their own standard. A second party certification would be that a trade association, say the cleaning trade association, the trade association of all the people who make cleaning products, says we've established a standard and here it is. Um, and a third party certification uh, is one that's established by an outside group. And so let's talk about what those are for cleaning products that we feel are effective and safe um, and actually meet a high standard for making sure that the um, products that have that label are actually gonna be safer and healthier for you and for the children in your care. So Green Seal is a very robust standard um, and you can find that logo on some cleaning products. Then there's also the UL Eco logo label, which similarly has very high standards for avoiding chemicals of concern. And then the US Environmental Protection Agency established a program called Safer Choice which uh, identifies safer products. It's not quite as stringent as Green Seal or Eco Logo, but it's also good. And the thing that we really like about uh, Safer Choice is that they have a fragrance-free section. And when it comes to cleaning, you know, oftentimes people will use scented products, one, because uh, we've been marketed to for generations that, uh, you know, we know that we're clean when we can smell the product that we use to clean things with, right? Like the pine saw clean, right? Um, it's not actually true. What you're smelling, if you're smelling something when you're done, it's because there's still a chemical in the air. And so what you really want is not to be noticing that you've cleaned. You, want, you don't want to be noticing a smell of something dirty. You don't want to be noticing the diaper changing station, right? But you also don't really want to be noticing that there's a chemical in the air. And really that's what fragrance is. It means there are chemicals, additional chemicals in the air. And so choosing fragrance free is really important. Um, another reason why people will use say air fresheners is because they haven't actually cleaned the air of the stinky stuff. And um, all you're doing is masking the problem and adding to the problem by adding additional chemicals into the air rather than actually removing the, the offensive uh, odors. And so uh, you can use things like uh, air filters to filter out uh, offensive smells. Um, you can also use like charcoal or um, uh, baking soda based uh, uh, odor absorbers. And then you can also just make sure that you're uh, containing uh, waste so that it doesn't smell and removing it frequently from your program. But if you're getting a lot of smells, it may also mean that you're uh, HVAC system, your um, heating and cooling system is not actually doing the job that it needs to be doing. So if you're, if it's not pulling out the air and making sure that you're getting fresh air in, um, it's definitely something that you should look into. And also consider opening windows to get more fresh air in. That can make a big difference. The truth is that indoor air is actually often more 
uh, contains more chemicals of concern than outdoor air, and part of it is because everything gets trapped inside. And when you add a fragrance, um, particularly if it's like, you know, uh, an air freshener, and it comes with additional things in, in addition to whatever that pretty smell is, um, and so you're basically adding harmful chemicals into that mix. So what can you do? One, cleaning products, for the most part, um, need to be kept separately. So if you've got a microfiber cloth, uh, you know, that's not going to be necessarily something that's uh, in a concentrated form could be harmful. But most cleaning products in a concentrated form could cause problems. So like paints and other household chemicals, you want to make sure that all cleaning products are stored in areas that children can't reach them. You also want to make sure that providers are not bringing cleaning supplies from home because uh, once you establish a policy and you identify the products that you want to use, um, providers bringing things in from home or, or other members of your staff will mean that they're likely deviating from the choices that you've made to be healthy and uh, to avoid harmful chemicals. Make sure that you're limiting eating and drinking to assigned areas so that you only have to sanitize or disinfect um, in those areas. And when you're cleaning, make sure that you're keeping screened windows open and using fans to ventilate. Make sure that you're following the label instructions so that if it calls for diluting the product, that's what you're doing. Make sure you're not using the products when children are in the area. And make sure that the air is clear before children go back into the space that's been cleaned. Definitely don't mix products. If you've got a product that is made with ammonia and another one that's made with bleach, and because they're not always fully labeled, you may not know, so don't mix products at all. But if you mix ammonia and bleach, you can produce a highly toxic gas that can be deadly. So wear protective gear, gear when needed for, um, for sanitizing and disinfecting especially. And make sure that you're only using those sanitizers and disinfectants where recommended by state and local authorities. And here I just want to pause and say that recent research has found that using cleaning chemicals is, for women over a number of years, either women who cleaned at home once a week or worked at, in a janitorial setting or uh, like child care providers or teachers had to do some of their own cleaning, um, the impact on respiratory function over time was the same as smoking a pack of cigarettes a day. This is deeply problematic and means that even if you're not so worried because kids are coming and going, your daily exposure to the products that you use to clean can have a real impact on your own health over time, can have an impact on how well you can breathe. And so we strongly encourage you to look for safer materials. So don't, don't do this. Don't have kids be participating in, in cleaning. Uh, so just briefly, uh, to get back to the fragrance question, candles should not be used. Um, please know that even though uh, essential oils may be derived from natural materials, they aren't all of the same quality, so they may be containing artificial um, additives. But also that when you concentrate anything down into a pure source, it can become more irritating. So there are essential oils that can be respiratory irritants or skin irritants to sensitive individuals. And I myself find that several essential oils um, and products made from essential oils like thyme oil actually make me have a hard time breathing. Um, and you don't know whether it's going to be you or a parent or a child who might have that kind of reaction. So really, you know, no smell is the best smell. So please consider that. And also just consider that a lot of times essential oils get used to accomplish something, right? Like they get used as a um, antibacterial, uh, uh, for an antibacterial purpose, or sometimes essential oils get used as uh, an aid to being healthy. So they have an impact on our body. They're biologically active in many cases. They're not just smelling pretty. So just keep that in mind when you're thinking about essential oils, which I know have become a lot more popular. So what to do, provide good ventilation, make sure that your um, systems are working well and that you have what are called HEPA filters in place. Uh, if you need a scent, consider putting lemon slices in a dish of baking soda, which would help absorb the other odors and you know, fresh um, whole uh, fruits or cinnamon cooking on a stove. Those kinds of things are, um, less likely to be um, harmful because they're not concentrated down the way that essential oils are, for example. 
so how do you know what to do? The folks at Inform Green Solutions have put together an amazing toolkit for you. Um, it talks about which products should be used to clean, how to know which areas should be sanitized and which disinfected and how often, what's the difference, all of those things. They have a list of all of the kinds of products that are approved by EPA that are actually green and safer um, and talk about what the dwell times are, so how long you have to wait before you can move on in order to be effective. Um, I highly recommend getting this curriculum. Um, and then once you start thinking about the ways you can make your, pro your program safer and healthier, there's an endorsement program you could consider. And uh, we collaborate with the EcoHealthy Child Care Program, which is run through the Children's Environmental Health Network. And basically what it comes down to is there's, they have a checklist of 30 steps that are easy to follow and low cost. And if you can complete uh, 24 of those, including the ones that are required, then you can become endorsed. And it's a pretty simple process. And the, the link to go there is right here on the screen. Um, I highly recommend that you check this out and consider becoming endorsed. Um, they offer a whole bunch of resources uh, as Clean and Healthy New York does since you're watching this webinar. Hopefully you've found your way to our website, which is cleanhealthyny.org. But you can also uh, get a lot of resources they've put together, fact sheets, uh, tips, uh, materials for parents um, by going to their website. The Informed Green Solutions for Green Cleaning is simply informedgreensolutions.org, and that's the site that will get you that toolkit that's so uh, useful and in-depth. And otherwise, there are a bunch of other resources that you can look for, including the Getting Ready for Baby campaign, which focuses on getting those manufacturers and retailers that are selling directly for uh, the zero to three marketplace to take action, and we've got a specific campaign aimed at the companies that sell directly to child care programs, so please check that out. If you have questions, don't hesitate to ask. I'm gonna give you the slide, next slide with my contact information, and I hope that you'll get in touch if uh, this has intrigued you and you wanna learn more. So thanks, thanks for helping us keep children healthy and uh, for doing what you can to make the safest and healthiest environment for child care. So I'm Bobby Wilding, Deputy Director. There's my contact information. This webinar and our other work to engage child care providers is uh, significantly funded by the New York State Pollution Prevention Institute, which is uh, through a grant from the New York State Environmental Protection Fund and run by the Department of Environmental Conservation. And I just wanna note that all of my opinions and findings and conclusions and recommendations are my own and our organizations and don't necessarily reflect the views of the Department of Environmental Conservation or uh, the Pollution Prevention Institute. Thank you so much. Please stay in touch and I look forward to hearing from you and good luck with your efforts to maintain a safe and healthy environment for the children in your care and for yourself.